Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to our talk today. Uh, my name is Chris Truncer, and I have the awesome Joe Leon with me as well. And uh, we are here to talk about what the F. Uh, just to give some background on myself, uh, probably the least important slide here of, of all of them is uh, my name is Chris Truncer. Uh, I'm some offset dude at uh, the, our company, 40 North Security. Uh, I am, uh, I've worked on a couple of different projects out there right now. Uh, that I like to open source and make available for everyone to use. Uh, I've presented and trained at Black Hat Asia, uh, Black Hat USA, pretty much a ton of different conferences all around the world. And uh, I started off as a sysadmin, so uh, never really got into development until actually a couple of years into my security work. But um, I, I loved servers, databases, everything and any, anything and everything about that. Uh, so that's really where I started before I made that jump into security. And uh, Joe, why don't you talk about yourself? Yep. Hey, everyone. I'm Joe. I'm an offensive security engineer uh, at 40 North. Uh, work on a couple open source projects. You can see there. I've trained with Chris at Black Hat, a couple of different Black Hats before and other conferences. Uh, and unlike Chris, I started my career out in sales. So it took a slightly different route to get uh, to where I am today. But uh, happy to be talking about F Sharp uh, with you guys today. So Let's start off this talk with the story, right? Let's have fun with it. So it's December, 2020, so last year, and we're on an internal pen test for a client. And they gave us a VM and they had a few different objectives for us, but one of them was super simple. They said, just try to get C2 comms uh, going on this VM. And we're like, yeah, like we got that. We have so many tricks up our sleeves, right? You know, a lot of different ways to route traffic. So we thought it was pretty easy. Um, but the challenge was they had a lot of good defensive controls in place. So first they had, they had ATP running, uh, but also they're using bit nine for app whitelisting and they really had things locked down. Like we absolutely could not use any unsigned executables or DLLs. Um, and a lot of the common app whitelisting bypasses that we typically would use to get uh, command or code execution, it's like they wouldn't work. We kept hitting this screen. Like this is the actual screen, obviously with their information blurred out, but like we kept hitting this screen and it was so frustrating because everything we were trying like wouldn't work. We tried so many different things. Like here's just like a quick like flavor of a few things. Like we love using MS build for app whitelisting bypasses, like gadget to JScript, .NET to JScript. We're using Wimic, this ghost loader technique, which is uh, out there and some folks have chatted about like we literally tried everything we could to get code execution everything was just either outright blocked or we might get an initial like beacon out and then it die immediately they, yeah um, they, they did a lot of good work because not only were they blocking all of these known susceptible binaries but they actually went back and and i believe largely blocked like past old versions that were still susceptible so even uh they, they had basically every hashed version of an of an application whitelisting bypassable like binary uh, blocked one way or another, even if it was valid signed. So it did prove to be quite uh, the conundrum to try to figure out how to bypass. Yeah, we were like through day two and a half and like we still we still didn't get C2 comms established and it was just so frustrating. But luckily, uh, maybe it was me or one of us on the team or we all read this uh, this article in particular by the folks at Red Canary um, from January of last year. And it talked about how adversaries could use, um, they were very like theoretical in the way they phrased it, but I imagine they had seen some of this uh, activity, but they were discussing how adversaries could use the C-sharp or F-sharp scripting console to execute scripts. And it's part of this whole idea of bring your own land, right? So you bring a binary that's Microsoft signed, say, for example, and use that because that's going to run on a, on a machine probably that has app whitelisting enabled, use that to execute your code. Um, so we were like, hmm, like maybe, maybe we could leverage that. And so in the article, this is what really like sparked my curiosity in digging into this is, and so this is an image from that Red Canary article, um, but it's the F sharp scripting console called FSI. Um, and basically like what you're seeing here is them importing Sharp exploits, um, one of the Sharp exploit modules or DLLs into this scripting console and then using it to get the host name of the computer. And I was thinking, wow, like maybe, maybe this could be the answer for what we're looking for. 
let's talk about it. Like what, what is F sharp? Now, now we kind of looked at how it can try to solve some of our problems. How can we actually do that? Well, uh, F sharp is a function oriented language. It's designed to be built around writing effective functions. Um, uh, it allows us, to, or it's not it allows us, but it automatically detects and infers data types. So when we're doing something like C sharp, we obviously have to define whether something's a string, an integer, uh, whatever data type it actually is. Uh, F sharp is similar to Python, where it's going to try to detect that at runtime. And, and like their documentation states that like, hey, we want you to focus on your code versus like the individual individual nuances of uh, our specific programming language. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier in that end when trying to write code uh, in F sharp. Uh, uh, Spoiler alert, at least in my opinion, I don't always think F sharp is the easiest to write in, um, but who knows, we can debate about that. Well, the nice thing is uh, you can write .NET code mixed into your F sharp code because uh, it is a .NET language. So we can use something like console.writeline and have output from whatever F sharp code that you wrote actually being output to the console. Uh, but in my, in my opinion, uh, it is a bit of a pain to try to pick up. I come from a like a Python, a PowerShell, and like a C sharp mix of a background uh, now, and uh, it, it's not—it's still not intuitive to me to completely learn and pick up. I, I don't know, Joe. Like, what do you think? Easy for you, or like, um, what's no, your thoughts? I, yeah, it's kind of—it's kind of a tricky language to get started. But I feel like once you get a few like templates of what you typically would want to do with it together, then it's not a big deal. You can kind of figure it out. But like initially getting started with it is like. Really, it really is a pain. The syntax is yeah. terrible, especially if you're scripting with it. Oh, uh, but yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so at least we're on the same page. In versus, uh, it's just it's just a me sort of thing. Um, the the other issue with this though is compiling binaries for like F sharp code can be a giant pain as well. Um, it really depends on what your IDE is, IDE that you're going to use is. Um, I usually like to, when I'm writing like C sharp code or anything like that, I typically write that in visual studio because I like the add-ins. I like uh, visual studio to, to code that language. In. Other languages I'm usually using like sublime text or Atom or visual studio code. Um, so it really depends. Uh, but like, because it's a .NET language, I want to write it in visual studio. However, uh, it's, it's a giant pain when it comes to the actual compilation itself. And we're going to talk about that right now. So how do we compile our code in F sharp? Well, there are a bunch of different ways, thankfully. Um, we can use Mono within Linux. Uh, you can use Visual Studio. Now, whether you're going to get like a single executable uh, with like everything all embedded within itself uh, versus needing to load libraries or DLLs, that's a different story. Um, you can use FSC, which is also uh, the built-in like compiler that you would install when you uh, install F sharp on Windows. So let's look at a couple of these different options and try to figure out, okay, are there any benefits to using any of these? Well, here is your basic, super basic um, hello world code in F sharp. So we- That's so we ugly. Can, yeah, uh, we can see like we are, are defining our, um, our open call, we're defining the entry point, we are using let, to define the arguments that we're using, uh, or excuse me, to actually state that we are using a, a defining a function. Um, we have our arguments there that are just stated as args. Um, uh, we have our, our basically like a try catch, if you will, functionality uh, built into this. We're basically now at this point, we're just printing hello world from whatever the argument is and uh, returning a, a zero code, assuming that uh, the value or that everything does work. And uh, if you see down below, there are F sharp C, this is on Linux. Um, we are passing it the script uh, that we just defined up above with our hello world. And then we're uh, passing along dash dash standalone flag. And that is going to be how you can compile your F sharp code into a standalone executable uh, on Linux uh, within mono or using mono and have it actually run on a Windows system. So for example, if we uh, continue on, when we basically bring that over, to uh, our window system and we call in this case, hello.exe and we pass in, pass in the argument like 40 North, you can see we get our hello world from 40 North. So this is nice because we are able to write code in Linux uh, and compile it on there and have it run on Windows. 
Uh, FSC, like I mentioned earlier, uh, is a F Sharp compiler for Windows too, though. Um, but the thing is, this is not installed by default on Windows systems. If you just go and uh, boot up Windows, obviously in VM or anything like that right now, and try to look for it, it's not going to be there. Uh, so what's the easiest way to get this installed is basically to install Visual Studio, and it has to be 2019. Uh, I, I believe I'd read that uh, it basically was not coupled with that or an option prior to 2019. So uh, that would be how you get it installed. Uh, but the thing is, finding its location can be another story. Like that's, there, it seems to have multiple different paths that it could be installed upon, uh, installed within your system. So uh, it's just something to be aware of. However, obviously you can use like built-in Windows searching to help find fsc.exe, and we'll have all the files that you need right within that directory. Yeah, and actually in the next couple of slides, we're gonna show a couple of the locations uh, of where that is. Um, all right, so let's get back to the story. We'll finish out this little story from this internal pen test that we were on. So we we had this idea that maybe the F sharp scripting console could be like the key to to getting some uh, shellcode execution. So we searched online and uh, found this great repository, VY Security. So I think it's Vincent, uh, Vincent Yu. Um, and so he had this dot fs file and so that was great so that basically is a shellcode injection template um, that he posted so he did some work in this like back in 2018 um, and so we we worked off of that and we're going to show a little bit of that later on as well as um, additional templates that we've created um, but so we started with that and then uh, we looked on the vm for uh, anything related to f sharp right we wanted that fsi.exe file because the goal was to use that scripting console in conjunction with the um, pre-existing shellcode template that I just showed you. And so we looked on the, the VM, and sure enough, there was nothing. There was nothing F-sharp related on that system. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, like use, installing Visual Studio is the easy, easiest way to get it on there. In fact, if Visual Studio is not installed, it's probably not uh, in existence on the, the host that you're on. And so we went back to a machine, a VM of our own, that we had Visual Studio installed, and we started looking for it. And so this is one of the paths, at least on, on our machine, where we found it. So like super, like way down, down there, uh, but starting at program files, x86 Visual Studio, and then way really down the Really easy to find, right? Really easy. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I can never remember it, so I have to keep opening this screenshot to figure out where it is. Um, but under the F sharp folder, you'll see a few things, um, fsc.exe. So that's what, um, uh, Chris was just talking about. And then FSI, which is the scripting console, which is what we need to execute our F sharp shellcode injection script. Um, so we found both of those there as well as, you know, dependent DLLs. Um, there's another location. This is slightly blurry. Sorry about that. Um, under program files.net SDK 5.0.103. Then there's an F sharp folder there as well. So you'll find similar files. Um, not sure if it's exactly all the same files or not, but um, at least FSC and FSI are both, um, both in that folder too. So once we had that um, FSI.exe, we transferred that over to our target VM. Um, and we went to just try to run that scripting console. And since it was a Microsoft signed, or it is a Microsoft signed um, binary, no problems with app whitelistings. That was great. Um, but it said could not load file or assembly F sharp dot core. So that it's missing a DLL is all that means. And so like, all right, well, I did see one of those core dot DLL files from before. So we transferred that over and we tried to run FSI.exe. And then we got this, oh, we couldn't load F sharp dot compiler dot private. And so we had to do this iterative process of like, figuring out what dependency was missing and then copying it over to our, our VM in the, in, the, in the environment where we we're operating. And eventually we stumbled upon these four dependencies plus FSI.exe will allow you to use the scripting console on a target machine. So it's fsharp.compiler.interactive.settings, fsharp compiler private, fsharp core, and Microsoft build utilities core. Those are the four DLLs that are needed in addition to the fsharp scripting console to, um, to use that scripting console. So we zipped those files, transferred them over, unzipped them, copied over our, um, our F sharp scripting file. So again, we used that template that, that Vincent, you uh, created. 
and then we executed it. And it's as simple as following fsi.exe, pass in the path to the scripting file, and then you can inject your shell code. And sure enough, uh, that managed to get our comms uh, up and running, established. We got a beacon. Um, now, four hours later, they definitely discovered our traffic and killed our access. But still, we proved the point that we could actually use this uh, program, this Microsoft signed binary, which would bypass a lot of app whitelisting scenarios to um, execute our code. So it was a success. And that was kind of the genesis for this talk. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. So uh, now let's talk about this idea of like execute assembly. Um, if whether or not we've heard of this phrase, it, it's commonly used uh, in relation to uh, having an unmanaged process uh, load managed code, right? Uh, so this is built into a bunch of different C2 frameworks like Cobalt Strike has this covenant interpreter. Um, you, you get the idea. Uh, the, the way that this generally works is you have an unmanaged process. So something written in C, C++, uh, and it loads managed code and uh, gets it to execute that within that process. So let's talk about this and see how this works. And is this something that we can do with F Sharp as well? So here is your stereotypical hello world program in C Sharp, right? Um, we, we are basically, we have a class definition. We, have, we are defining the main uh, function. And in this case, all we're doing is having it right out to the screen uh, is just hello world. So very, very basic. Um, now, this screenshot is from Cobalt Strike. Uh, if we were going to use this with XC assembly like it shows, uh, it's going to attempt to load that .NET assembly all in memory and get it running and uh, basically executing on the system where we have our beacon. And in this case, we can see we, we do call that. Uh, we have it run the hello world.executable and um, we are actually getting our output. So we see uh, it does have hello world. So great, so we are having unmanaged code, again, load the CLR or the common language runtime within itself to execute our .NET code. Well, the way it works is after the CR CLR is loaded into the current process, we can execute that. So that, that's why it, it does work because the CL CLR is loaded within that process. So. This is useful because uh, we can inject our .NET assembly uh, into a different process and have it actually get that up and running without ever having to drop our actual assembly disk. So this is great, obviously, from the perspective of we're trying to avoid AV detection. Uh, as long as we can live and reside in memory, the better, right? Uh, and the nice thing is like there are um, EDR software that basically anytime that you drop something to disk, it's being shipped off to the mothership somewhere. And it's going to be for uh, offline analysis at some point. Well, we can avoid having that happen by uh, residing in memory and having our code uh, execute within that. So how does this work, right? So now, now that we have a rough idea of what execute assembly does, this uh, unmanaged code running managed code, uh, what are the calls and, and how does it actually work? Well, if we go to our next slide here, we can see uh, this is actually taken from uh, the website I Red Team. Uh, which is, by the way, awesome website. You should definitely all check that out and um, read all the different posts on there. Uh, I, I don't want to try to run the, read this line by line, but basically we're using CLR to create instance to receive basically an instance of the CLR. And with this, uh, I, and what we're receiving is the ICLR meta host. Are we then using the get runtime functionality to receive an interface uh, for a specific version of the CLR that we want to load? So. There are different versions of .NET. Uh, when we call this, we're going to specify what version of that do we want it to load? 2.0, 4.0, what, what do we want? Uh, get interface is what actually loads the CLR into that current process, so that unmanaged process. And uh, we re retrieve an interface uh, with this ICLR runtime host. Basically, when we call start then, it initializes the CLR within the current unmanaged code process. And then uh, what's actually typo, which it should be execute in default app domain, is going to go ahead and load, uh, in this case, our C -sharp .NET assembly and call a specific method. And if we need to provide any arguments, um, that's where we would do so at this point in time. So if we look at our next slide, this is basically, uh, again, also from the iRed team website, but just a, a proof of concept of what this should seem like uh, if we're looking at it with, within code. Uh, we are basically specifying, hey, we want to load uh, version 4.0. Uh, we're calling in this case, uh, we're going to have it execute CLR hello 1.exe. 
and um, it's going to go ahead and load our .NET executable within this application. The thing to note though, is that it does not appear to be embedded within this application. So uh, this is actually stored on disk, but it is able to load that managed code into this unmanaged code and uh, get it to execute. So now that we had a, a very quick primer on how does uh, execute assembly uh, work, uh, let's talk about how do we code for that, right? So this is more speaking not to the C, C++, the unmanaged code side, but the managed code. Um, well, the, the really the main primary coding requirement uh, that we're going to need to follow is uh, you, you almost essentially want like a global try accept or try catch for your .NET code. Um, because in the event that there's any error at all uh, and you aren't catching it, you're going to get the dreaded invoke three error, um, which uh, if, if you've written your own .NET code and assemblies, like you've probably seen this before, uh, it, it's annoying and you, you got to track down exactly where you're not catching an error. Or you can just pull go YOLO and just like global try catch and uh, or try accept and try to make sure that you could just catch anything and everything and print it out and to get rid of it. The big thing to note though is that's not necessarily just a cobalt strike annoyance. Like I get that a lot because we use cobalt strike a lot. And uh, if we're trying to write .NET code, uh, I see that in cobalt strike. And I used to think for a while that it was just a nuance of cobalt strike and how it would try to get the .NET assembly loading. That I learned, I was incorrect. Uh, that is not a Cobalt Strike annoyance or implementation of this idea or process. Uh, it's actually basically what's going to be required to get your assembly to load and run within an unmanaged process. Well, guess what? Hey, this same thing exists. This issue, this annoyance, this requirement, whatever you want to call it, uh, exists when you're trying to load F sharp code. Uh, it's not. You, you, it's just because we switch from C sharp to F sharp, we don't get rid of that uh, dependency, if you will. Well, let's not get too far ahead. We're gonna keep talking about this. So now that we have a better understanding of how uh, this XU assembly technique works, let's discuss applying this to F sharp instead of C sharp. And the reason we thought about this is, well, the CLR can execute C sharp code, right? Execute assembly loads the CLR. Uh, but F sharp is also uh, able, or the CLR is able to execute F sharp code. So shouldn't execute assembly be able to just run F sharp code? Well, let's check it out. Here again uh, is a, an even more basic uh, F sharp code where we are defining the entry point. We have our main function there and we are not even doing anything with arguments. We are just printing a hello world and returning the value of zero. So this is uh, super basic. And at this point, we will just go ahead and compile this into an executable a standalone executable and try to run this with Cobalt Strike's execute assembly. Well, uh, in this case, that did not work, right? Because we tried to run it and we got that invoke three on entry point error failure. So um, this is unfortunately something that we're uh, very familiar with, especially when we were first learning how to try to use F sharp with Cobalt Strike and make this work. Uh, but we all, what we also did notice is that if I tried to run that same binary uh, within uh, just the command line, is that uh, we got a different error. And that's uh, actually not because of uh, invoke three. Uh, as you can see here, this is saying like, hey, the F sharp core dot DLL is missing. Uh, so it can't actually load that. That's when we just took um, just the standard binary and tried to copy that and transfer that over to the system. And again, that's because uh, F sharp is not installed by default, right? Like that's just not part of uh, like Windows. Uh, it's it's going to be generally installed if you have Visual Studio or if you go out of your way to actually uh, install F sharp. So at this point, we were trying to figure out, okay, what can we do to um, figure out like this dependency issue so that we can actually weaponize this on our test? Yes, yeah, so we thanks, Chris. So we started brainstorming, uh, and just to clarify, when we tried that before in Cobalt Strike, it wasn't a standalone assembly. That was just like just regularly compiling it because standalone assemblies is one of the options that we might might be able to do here. So we were thinking through this and like maybe we do the standalone assembly where meaning all of the dependencies for that .NET assembly are embedded in it, and maybe we run that through Execute Assembly. Maybe that's an option. Maybe we just have to drop. The dependencies to disk, right? So dropping F sharp dot core dot DLL, a Microsoft signed DLL to disk, isn't too crazy. Although it definitely could become an indicator of of compromise of some sort. 
Um, we could try adding it to the global assembly cache. It's another option. Um, or, and this was the last idea, and this took the most research, which we'll be talking about for the majority of the rest of the talk, is resolving these dependency errors within our execute assembly process. Um, and so that's really where all the cool stuff is, but let's first like step through how we were iter iteratively thinking about how to solve this. So first is the concept of these standalone assemblies like I was just mentioning. Um, so when you compile a um, F-sharp uh, source code into a, an assembly, you could do this um, dash dash assembly, or I'm sorry, dash dash standalone flag. Um, and that will incorporate all of the dependencies that it needs. So like it won't have that, oh, we can't find fsharp.core.dll. It won't, it won't say that. Um, but the problem is it's a super large file. It's 1.5 megs. Like that's a huge file for three lines of code. It makes no sense whatsoever. So um, aside from it just being massive and annoying, it actually won't work with Cobalt Strike. It won't load and execute in um, using execute assembly that large of a file. I tried this with Covenant using the equivalent execute assembly and it did work. So I don't know how the size constraints uh, work on Covenant versus um, Cobalt Strike, but um, although it's an answer, it's not the answer we were looking for. Um, so it, it works, but I think there's, oh, I know there's better. I already told you there's a better option. Um, okay, so another thought, thing we thought was like, let's drop fsharp.core.dll, which was the missing dependency uh, to disk. And so we dropped it to, um, well, well, first let me step back. In, in Cobalt Strike and other CPU frameworks, when you are using a, um, a, you spin up a process or spawn a process for post-exploitation jobs that you're then gonna kill right after, um, you typically will, uh, in a malleable profile or something similar, you'll mention or you'll, you'll define where that um, program lives. So you say like, yeah, I wanna do post-exploitation jobs and run DLL or whatever it is. Probably not, but whatever. So um, the idea was we would drop fsharp.core.dll to the directory where that um, program lives, where your spawn to or spawn as um, uh, program binary actually lives. And typically that's gonna be under like C Windows System 32 or Syswell uh, 64 or something like that. Um, and the challenge with that and that works. So you can see there, like we dropped it to disk. It's not in the current directory where we are, but it's in the directory where we're using the spawn to process. Um, and, it, and it actually worked, right? We didn't have to use standalone, it worked. But um, it typically, you'll typically need local admin access to drop a DLL to those directories, right? Because you typically don't have, as a regular user, you don't have permissions to write to program files or C Windows System 32 in some directories. So for that reason, like this works just like standalone works, but it wasn't good enough because it requires local admin rights and that's not always ideal. Similarly, also requiring local admin rights is the idea of instead of having to write and drop this DLL to a specific directory, um, why don't we just install it in the global assembly cache? And so that's entirely possible. The challenge uh, is if Visual Studio is not installed, which if it were installed, F Sharp would probably be on your machine anyway, but if Visual Studio is not installed, you have to copy over a few um, like global assembly cache administrative binaries um, and dependencies to actually install one of these DLLs into the global assembly cache. And again, you need local admin rights. But that's totally possible. And then once you do, you could use execute assembly as well um, through Cobalt Strike or wherever else without having to do the standalone compilation. So that worked, but again, really not, not an ideal, ideal setup for us. So we spent like, I don't know, there's definitely like, not weeks straight, mind you, I wasn't doing this full time, but over several weeks, uh, there was a lot of like, both of us were like looking into figuring out like how we could resolve these dependency errors like quite dynamically and from within our, um, like our bootstrap environment. And so like, luckily Jean May, um, which I think he's within Bezo, he wrote this post, um, which I'll show a screenshot of later, talking about this concept called app domain, assembly resolve and like this solved our issues and, and we'll discuss that uh, in a couple slides. Uh, but first, like let's, let's take a step back. So what question are we trying to really answer right now? Um, well, in our opinion, the, the one thing that we wanted to solve uh, is how can we execute F sharp or, or managed code uh, within unmanaged code? 
So um, that's what we set out to solve because we thought like that that would help fix our issues um, that we were we were having with all these different DLLs that we were that were requirements. Uh, so we wanted to figure out how we can do that. Um, we also didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we started looking at uh, existing code bases that we could possibly modify and uh, adapt to our uh, fit our needs, and we found one. So it was this project called Hosting CLR, which is available on GitHub. So you can go to this link and download it. Uh, Hosting CLR is a C++ project that is used to run C Sharp or .NET assemblies from within itself. So this is nice because basically the project has a uh, like like a video you can watch how it works. It has obviously like a README, but basically what it happens is you take your .NET assembly, you convert it essentially to like a byte array, uh, embed that byte array within the uh, C++ code and run it and the code will basically execute your code, but it's all embedded within it. So we are now embedding our um, application or library or whatever it is that we need within the code and not needing to drop multiple files to disk. Well, so we wanted to see if this can actually work with an F-sharp assembly and run that. Well, we know how to compile F-sharp now. Uh, we've we can make and have made simple like hello world applications and uh, convert that into a standalone binary that does not require that embeds all the DLLs and everything that it's inside of it. So we took that application, converted it into that byte array, and then embedded it within the hosting CLR uh, application. And we crossed our fingers and ran it. And uh, it resulted in multiple errors, uh, some of which we could figure out and resolve. So this took some editing of the code base to make it work for um, our, our needs specifically such as we had to define uh, different sizes of um, constants to match like what we were embedding. It was easily done. Um, but we were still running to invoke in invoke three error along with the Windows error code. But we got super lucky. Uh, the error code and the um, everything that we were issue that we were running into had an actual GitHub issue. Not only that, uh, the maintainer of the code uh, actually went into the issue and provided the actual code that would act, that would fix the problem. So uh, not only uh, did this uh, issue exist, um, but it actually, another person had the same error, but we also had our answer to fix that. So like, how often does that happen, right? Like I can think of all the times that I use open source code or different projects that like, obviously we're all gonna run into like random issues, but to actually have the answer there that worked right out of the box for us was great. So let's try to use that. So now let's try to use our existing F-sharp app, which uh, accepts arguments and run it within the modified hosting CLR code base. But something was still missing. Even though we tried and, and embedded the application within it, uh, we were still having an issue where we were running to this invoke three error message and we needed to figure it out. So that's where getting back to Jean May's article about assembly resolve really came to play. So just like to recap where we are real quick, we have this hosting CLR code base that we've modified to try to fit for our F-sharp purposes. The idea of using that is to kind of mimic the execute assembly style, like unmanaged code, execute and managed code. And so we took this, we compiled this hello world in F-sharp, not with the standalone flag, like just like the basics, right? Um, with no dependencies built in, threw it in this hosting CLR, and we were still getting those errors that Chris talked about after all the fixing. And so we determined that it was because there were still these fsharp.core.dll dependency errors. Like that was still, still the issue. And that makes sense because if we were executing this on a machine where um, that DLL is not in any path that it's going to be searching for, it's not in the assembly cache, et cetera, like it's, it's going to force an error that invoked three error. And so we're gonna chat about assembly resolve, which I was super excited to read about because like this like solved all these issues I was I was looking into. And so this is a screenshot from John May's article. So it's redteamer.tips, his website. And basically this discusses what like app domain.assembly resolve, what this method means. And, and like the bottom line is the first sentence of the, the second paragraph. So it's a it's a callback function that when the app domain, which is loaded in uh, with the CLR, can't find a specific assembly, it's gonna fire that callback function, right? So if it can't find fsharp.core.dll, it's gonna fire, our program's gonna fire assembly resolve to look for it. 
And so we went searching all over GitHub for, for you know, proof of concept code on, on how to deal with this in, in C Sharp. And we cobbled together a whole bunch of different people's um, work here. Um, but basically what you're looking at is, so there's two functions. First, we're defining this assembly resolver function, which we will call right after we start the runtime host. If you think back to when Chris was talking about how bootstrapping the CLR from unmanaged code works, at a certain point, the runtime host calls this function start or a method start. So we're going to call assembly resolver right after start. And obviously, you guys will have access to all this code after we're going to make it public. Um, but just for hopefully for some context to understand where this would go. Um, but we call assembly resolver. And then assembly resolver is going to call when it um, assembly resolve this other function. And so it's going to call it when it typically would kick off the app domain dot assembly resolve um, callback function. And so this function, the, the bottom one, is the one we're, we're really interested in here. Here we're basically saying, like, tell me what DLL you're looking for, what dependency you're looking for. If its name is F sharp, right? So if it starts with F sharp, which is down here toward the middle bottom, then what we're going to do is we're going to read in this byte array. And then we're going to load that byte array as an assembly in this process. So we are dynamically saying, if there's a dependency error or um, issue, right, resolving for fsharp.core.dll, load these bytes that we already have ready uh, and load that into the, um, the app domain. And then we'll be good to go. And so what that looks like is us uh, defining basically a byte, of, a byte array of fsharp.core.dll Right, so that's all of these these bytes here, um, and we took that this code from, and again you'll see this in the code we released, but we took that from like the open source F Sharp uh, GitHub repository. So it's yeah, based on permission. Seemingly you could add it into any code that you need, but obviously check the the legal T's and C's. Um, but so you define all these bytes, and then later on when we call assembly resolver, if that has to fire, which it will in a, on a machine where F Sharp that core.dll is not installed. It will grab this assembly, load it in, um, and resolve the dependencies. And sure enough, when we tried to do this, um, it executed with no problem. And that's with F Sharp not even um, residing anywhere on disk. Um, so, like, finally, after weeks of trying to figure out how to do this, uh, we got it. And so, that's just like a proof of concept uh, to demonstrate how the execute assembly concept can be used. Uh, for F sharp code by embedding the key dependency, which is F sharp .dll, within the execute assembly like unmanaged code, um, and then referencing that with the um, for when the app um, the assembly resolve method uh, fires. Okay, let's briefly talk about process injection. So let's shift gears a teeny bit just to give you guys on and gals on the um, offensive side. Uh, an understanding of how like shellcode injection works. So in F sharp. So first thing to know is like along with all the weird syntax, like obviously the the byte syntax is going to be real weird. So a byte array looks like on the bottom row. So it's zero x whatever hex you need, and then u y and then uh, semicolon, and it's in between two like bars and then like brackets. Like that's how you define a byte. Array. It's like a it's madness. I wonder why no you made that like decision. Like that, that bothers me. I hate looking at this. It's just so ugly. I don't like it. It looks there's just so much extra stuff going on. I don't even understand. I'm sure there's good reason, maybe, but uh, anyway, just fair warning. That's how it looks. If you need to convert your hex into into that. Um, okay, so let's look at platform invoke. So p invoke platform invoke. It's a way for managed code to get at Win32 APIs. So it's very common for shellcode injection um, processes. So this is an example of launching message box via, so that's the message box API in the user32 DLL. Um, so with platform invoke in C sharp, we're going to show you F sharp next for comparison, but in C sharp, you define um, access to this message box uh, method or, or API using this DLL import statement and private static extern um, declaration to access message, message box. And then you can call it down. You see we're calling it in our main function um, down there. And so that's kind of like platform invoke in C-sharp. In F-sharp, it looks like this. Honestly, it's very similar, 
right? You, you discuss your dependencies up top with the open statement instead of using. DLL import is in there again. This extern um, tag or I, I'll call it a tag. I'm sure there's a better word. Keyword maybe. Talk about it. Yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, and then message box. And then there's a few like types that you have to get used to. Like instead of like int pointer, it's like native int here. And like, there's a few things that you'd have to get used to, but just look at some sample code and we're providing that. You'll be able to get a, get the hang of it. Um, and then you can call it down here. Very similar to C sharp. So the point of showing this is like platform invoke in both languages is like, super compatible and it won't take much effort if you want to um, port over some of the code. Um, so let's actually look at a shell code injection proof of concept from Vincent Yu, so VY Securities GitHub repository. This is the one we used on that assessment that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, pretty simple idea here, based on, on this platform invoke concept, we're defining virtual alloc, create thread, and wait for single, uh, single object, and then we're basically allocating space down uh, down toward the bottom with virtual alloc. We're copying our code over from where the shell code was before into that newly allocated space, executing a thread and, and uh, wait for single object to make sure um, the process doesn't kick us out uh, prematurely. So that's like the basic um, the basic code. And so we wanted to provide and and use some templates that we've been using recently on assessments. Um, so this is. Just going to step through briefly um, a new template that we're going to release. It's for use calling create remote thread. Um, so remote process injection um, using uh, F sharp. So here we just have to define a few more um, Win32 API methods or APIs, I guess. Um, virtual alloc X, create remote thread, write process memory, create process, virtual protect X. So those are the, the core ones. And if you have studied shellcode injection at all, like you'll know this is like the elementary stages of shellcode injection, but the idea is to provide everybody with a foundation uh, on which to build more advanced templates. Something that actually was kind of a large pain here was defining structs and, um, and these flag structures. So here are some examples. It was a large pain to write all this out, um, but hopefully this serves as a good template for, for folks to create additional ones uh, in their code. And then actually calling, um, injecting into remote process here. Uh, in this case, we are spawning a process in a um, suspend, suspended state, the util man uh, that XC process from syswell 64 directory. Um, and then we're allocating space in it with virtual alloc X. We're writing to it with write process memory. We're changing protections, uh, address space protections, and then calling create remote thread to execute um, the shell code. And those are the, uh, so that's one template. And then um, as Crystal mentioned, the next slide, we're gonna have a couple other templates for you as well. Yeah, so uh, we are going to be uh, releasing and making available uh, What the F. Uh, it is, as we say, it's a, a collection of different resources that you can use to hopefully help you uh, on your assessment or assessments. So there are a bunch of different options here. Uh, we have just some basic shellcode injection. So like we have Vincent's uh, template in here, which is it's all his code that we uh, provided here just to include it within the repo. We have a, a remote shellcode injection using create remote thread for the API to actually create that thread remotely. We also have an, another uh, proof of concept template uh, leveraging Q user APC within F sharp. So uh, these are all pretty useful that you can use to um, just see like, how does the code look? Like what should it look like? Um, if you're trying to write these in F sharp. Uh, there are other options out there for you too, which we are um, probably going to be making available uh, within this repo is uh, we all know that we need to, or usually have to bypass EMC, right? And ETW. Um, this is a relatively trivial task because there are many websites like tools, blog posts, and other documentation out there that show you how to do it. Like if you go to like amzfail.com, you're going to automatically get like a, a every time you load, it's going to be a different way to bypass AMZ. Um, we have this GitHub project called AMZ Bypass uh, PowerShell. We have Rost and Mouse's AMZ patch. There's a ton of different ways that's already documented on how to let, uh, use these to bypass AMZ or ETW. Well, hey, guess what? Uh, this is useful also with F Sharp. Uh, it might be useful to spend the time uh, diving in, uh, understanding those techniques, and basically implementing that with your F sharp code, because uh, it will be useful to you to um, get that done to help 
from an offensive security perspective. So we're also going to include a guide on how to execute F Sharp uh, where, where where you want it to run. So it's basically going to be a, 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 the TLDR of this talk, if you will. Uh, we're going to talk about how FSI can be used to um, script and get code running on your targets, um, dropping standalone uh, F Sharp assemblies, different ways that you can get DLL on disk, whether that's just within the uh, directory that your uh, post exploitation process resides within, whether that's loading it or adding it to the uh, global assembly cache, or maybe you're doing something uh, similar to what we did with like hosting CLR to actually embed it within your application and get your dot, uh, .NET F Sharp code running that way. Yeah, and just just to clarify, the hosting CLR version that we like created or I don't know added to, we're gonna release that as well within this whole repository. So um, there's a proof of concept for this execute assembly style in in F Sharp. Yep. So what's next? Like, what else do we want to work on with this? Well, uh, probably the next best step would be uh, to have this implemented uh, because we leverage Cobalt Strike a lot as a beacon object file. Uh, this will allow us to execute F Sharp um, within the current beacon process and um, avoid having to drop like a, a files to disk, uh, avoid having to create a child process. So um, this is probably going to be the next step that we're going to take in adding it into that repository. We're also going to look uh, at adding syscalls in F-Sharp so that we can, instead of having to directly um, call user land APIs, uh, we can inject or invoke directly different syscalls to try to help bypass um, any hooking that EDR uh, may be doing into our applications. And then finally, we're also going to start looking to port some of our C-Sharp tools into F-Sharp. Uh, so let's talk, I mean, just what are some of the limitations of F-Sharp? Well, uh, like I said, I, and I don't want to speak for Joe uh, completely, so ch chime in. Uh, I like when I'm coding .NET using Visual Studio, um, but compilation of F Sharp with Visual Studio isn't pretty. I mean, what, what's your take, Joe? Do you, are you a Visual Studio person generally too, or you tell me? If I need to be, yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I mean, I like it. Uh, I, I do like IntelliSense. We use uh, different add-ins like ReSharper, which makes uh, coding uh, helpful, a little bit more easier. Um, and you can use that with F Sharp in Visual Studio, and it'll work, but you can't really compile it. And that's kind of a lie. Uh, you can compile your F Sharp code, but it's going to generate uh, multiple binaries. Um, you're going to have like your executable, which is basically going to be a loader for a DLL, which is where your actual code seems to really actually reside. So uh, even though like Stack Overflow and basically every resource I found online says, hey, you can make standalone executables. If you just provide like an extra compiler flag, aka like dash dash standalone, um, I've not got that to work. So uh, if if someone else does it and actually has the option right after this talk, that'd be pretty stellar because uh, then we'd be happy to like update any code or blog post or anything with that. Um, but it's not a standalone binary. Uh, and the other big thing though with F sharp is that you have relatively large binaries, right? Like everything's basically. 1.5 megs or greater. And that, that was when we had like a two line F-sharp script of hello world. Uh, you can think of it almost similar to Python, right? Like if you try to compile a Python script to run on Windows, like you're having to load up all the different dependencies, including the interpreter. Uh, and that's like three or more megs. So at least we're not that big, but uh, with F-sharp, um, you are gonna have a relatively large standalone binary if you want to have it everything self-contained. But fortunately, it doesn't have to be self-contained. Yes, thank you, Joe. Uh, so let's talk uh, detecting F-sharp tradecraft. Well, uh, first of all, I definitely want to call out Matt Graber and Red Canary. Um, they uh, Thank you to Matt Graber and Red Canary. Um, we contacted them uh, a few weeks ago uh, to basically say, hey, we have this idea of how we're, we want to implement F-sharp um, and, and do different things with it. Uh, would you be interested or have uh, would like to or be able to provide um, some detection uh, information that we can include in our talk as well? And uh, they were both super happy. Matt uh, gave us a huge write-up on it, uh, which we're actually going to talk about right here. So uh, thank you, Matt and uh, Red Canary, for helping provide this information. So some of the main notes that uh, Matt actually gave is uh, AMZ is able to catch and review the full contents of an embedded F-sharp application. So AMZ is useful. Uh, if you are a defender, you want to make sure you instrument and leverage AMZ 
uh, so that you can use that to help make decisions and uh, detect possibly F sharp being used within your environment. Uh, .NET uh, ETW can capture it, can capture the loading of the embedded F sharp executable and F sharp F sharp core. So, uh, like with this hosting CLR project, if we're not trying to bypass or block AMZ from basically seeing anything, like its optics will be able to see that information or those applications, like or DLLs being loaded. So uh, you, you'll have the opportunity to see that being loaded into an application. Uh, you can easily observe uh, what the CLR and MS Core DLLs uh, being loaded within the application. Uh, and overall, uh, Matt suggested like the detection focus really should remain on the behaviors related to .NET execution rather than like the .NET language implementation itself. So don't necessarily worry about like what this specific language is doing. Like we want to know like what's the behaviors behind it. Like what's actually happening that we can detect it from that perspective. Uh, and overall, um, .NET and AMZ optics can provide some rich opportunities to detect the in-memory loading. So um, we want to, as a defender, you want to be able to make sure you can see those to try to help detect this from happening, or detect this when it is happening. Uh, as an offensive security person, uh, you want to uh, look to try to avoid that sort of stuff, right? So you want to look to see if you can patch AMZ or prevent ETW from um, actually capturing uh, evidence that you are performing something on a system. Uh, for example, there's an MDSEC uh, blog post right here, which you can look into. So overall, some takeaways from this talk is uh, we wanted to, it's been documented before, obviously Vincent uh, had a script out there as available uh, and made it available, but we really wanted to try to help bring F Sharp forward as an alternative to C-sharp in offensive tooling. Um, it can be executed largely the same as C-sharp in unmanaged code. Uh, you have access to, the, uh, to .NET, so you can run on a Windows system. Uh, it can and should be used as a language for coding tools uh, from an offensive perspective, right? Because there's a, not a lot of stuff out there that we've seen that's really been targeting F-sharp tooling, largely because it's not really been used. So, at the moment, now is a great time if you uh, want to try to leverage and learn F Sharp, uh, that'll most likely be relatively successful in the environment that you're operating in. Defenders should instrument their fleet to try to obtain as much telemetry as possible for detection purposes, right? Uh, you wanna rather spend the time on understanding the behaviors of offensive tooling and understand how they work, what they're doing, so you can actually block uh, a technique or a tool from that perspective rather than like a nuance of like the, the .NET language that is being written. Uh, so F Sharp is very useful. Uh, I, I don't like necessarily coding in it. Uh, it's better than Perl, um, but uh, it is it is effective and has been very useful for us on our assessments. Um, Joe, just curious, do you have, you have any uh, closing notes or thoughts or anything you want to add into this? Not just give it a try. If you're really curious about jumping into and building off of what we've worked on, um, having some help with this beacon object file would be great because I think that's like the next step for actually making this like uh, at par with C sharp for at least with Cobalt Strike um, operators, just to, so that it's super easy to use. You could it's almost interchangeable at that point um, with with running like a C sharp .NET assembly uh, in memory, but um, no, just we really wanted to bring uh, some attention to F Sharp because it is a, a very viable option. Um, and uh, as Chris said, uh, yeah, we, we people should be looking into it a bit more. Awesome. Well, by the time this talk uh, is published, uh, the GitHub repo will be live. So um, we'll obviously be like tweeted out, um, we'll put out the slides as well so that anyone can download them and use them. The code base will be active. Uh, so Thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to give this talk. Uh, so I hope it went well. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, definitely hope that you all start diving into F Sharp. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, uh, Twitter, email, anything, anytime. Um, thank you very much and have a good rest of your day.